The former Ghanaian president, uh, Jerry Rawlins, is dead. He died from COVID-19-related complications earlier yesterday at Kolebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, the capital city of Ghana, at the age of 73. President Muhammadu Buhari and Anna Kufa, the president of Ghana, president of the African Development Bank, uh, Dr. Akumi Adishina, and former president of the Senate, Dr. Bukala Saraki, and the People's Democratic Party, PDP, were among the personages and the groups that yesterday condoled with the people and the government of Ghana over the passage of their former president, Jerry Rollins. And uh, Dr. Abati, uh, this quite uh, a man that meant many things to many different people. Uh, some will not forget the execution of the former past president in Ghana that he said was to stabilize the country. Some will also forget the economic turnaround that hit Ghana under his watch, you know. It's quite uh, a man that polarized opinions, uh, but a lot of people say he's an African patriot, or Papa J, as it was fondly called, uh, in Ghana. Your take on uh, the life and times of uh, Jerry John Rollins. Well, first, let's commiserate with the people of Ghana and his family also uh, on his passing. Uh, there's no doubt that um, former President Jerry John Rollins, his actual surname is John. He became Rollins because there was a mistake, mm. you know. Um, and he became J.J. Rawlings, Scottish uh, father, Ghanaian uh, mother, and Ghana runs a matrilineal uh, society. But he ended up becoming a pivotal force in the history of Ghana. He was the man who helped to uh, move uh, Ghana from uh, military rule to liberal democracy. No matter what you say about opinion being divided uh, against him. And in the 90s, I mean, Ghana was a country that was on its knees. Many Nigerians will remember how Ghanaians uh, became refugees in Nigeria. How, you know, a Ghanaian professor will be seen doing a, a, what do they call it in Yoruba language, a Jikani shop. Mm. And the Jikani shop man will tell you that back in Ghana, he was a professor. So uh, Jerry Rollins came, he had the initial coup, then later uh, we, we had the uh, June Revolution. June 4 revolution. And that became a turning point uh, for Ghana. And as president, I think 1992, uh, uh, when he won an election, and also 1996, uh, uh, he helped to establish a liberal democracy in Ghana. But many people still remember his past as uh, a soldier, as a flight uh, lieutenant, lieutenant. Uh, who staged a coup, and then he handed over power and then he came back, he escaped from prison, ran to the United States, came back again and grabbed power back and then became a, a democratic uh, leader. I do not think that a time will ever come when the history of modern Ghana will be written and uh, Jerry Rawlings will not be remembered. In fact, it can be uh, successfully, it can be appropriately described as the father of modern Ghana. The only other uh, person that I may be wrong, this is, can be debated, that can rival with him, would probably be uh, Nkrumah, you know, who is the father of uh, Ghanaian uh, nationalism. But he came and he turned that country around. And even 20 years after he left office, he remained an inspiring figure uh, in uh, Ghanaian politics. Of course, some people did not agree with him, uh, but there was nothing they could do about him because he had become an icon of uh, modern Ghana. So it's passing. Uh, you know, it's a major loss for the people of Ghana because even 20 years after leaving office, he remained a major influence. He was also uh, a great family man. And I think that uh, that's a, you know, a side of him that romantic people like you, uh, Rufai, would admire, you know, because uh, uh, he, he was a loving husband and he was a doting uh, father. Um, three daughters, one son, and only recently he was in the media burying his uh, uh, grandmother. His and mother, actually. Well, his own mother. His own mother, yeah, Victoria okay. Togwe. She yes. was 101. So, yeah. And then in the uh, upcoming December elections in, uh, in uh, Ghana, um, it was uh, a major factor. The, uh, uh, the, um, you know, the factor that he represents was a major issue, uh, but now he's dead. But I do not think that with his death, that, uh, you know, his symbolism, his achievement, 
his iconism uh, would uh, disappear. Mm. Um, I would like to urge uh, the Nigerian government to send immediately uh, a delegation, not a mission in Ghana, uh, but a delegation from Abuja to commiserate with his uh, family and also to uh, attend his uh, funeral, uh, you know, uh, when a, a date is fixed. Because in every sense, he also helped long before John Mahama to promote Ghana-Nigeria bilateral relations. I mean, the uh, presidents that you can say are closest to Ghana in terms of, uh, to Nigeria, in terms of relationship will probably be uh, John Mahama, who lived for a while in Nigeria, uh, Akufo Ado, uh, who is our in-law, I think his first wife was in Nigeria. Yeah, was in Nigeria. But even uh, President Rawlings was very close to Nigeria. My mm -hmm. first encounter with him was actually in a nightclub in Nigeria, the night shift collision. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a club uh, led by uh, uh, Ken Caleb Solumise, mm -hmm. the Ganga Gallery uh, of the Gallery. <laughs> from the university town of Ekpoma. Ekpoma. The ultimate show shiner, God have mercy. <laughs> you know, and we hosted, you know, uh, uh, J.J. Yeah, yeah, Robbins, yeah. and you could see, you know, his humanism, his, um, his uh, humility. He, he wasn't behaving like a former uh, president of Ghana. You know, he, 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 mm. he, he had a common touch. Yeah. And I think that, you know, uh, Ghana, the people of Ghana, they have lost a uh, historic figure, yeah. a legend, a man who was a pivotal figure in their history. I mean, it's not said to the edge whether yeah. he died uh, from complications um, from uh, COVID-19. Uh, but you see, every living thing will die. Yeah. Every star would uh, wither yeah. at some point. Yeah. But we're glad uh, that we had a man like Jerry John Rawlings. All right, uh, but just some quick updates. Uh, the government of Ghana has declared seven days national mourning. Uh, uh, when uh, the news broke yesterday, Mahama was campaigning somewhere in the Volta region in the forthcoming elections in December in Ghana, and he had to suspend his campaign to go see the family. Uh, the family, his wife and daughters, uh, went to meet the president yesterday night about 7.30 p.m. to officially tell the president that Jerry John Rawlings had passed, and afterwards he reacted to it. He issued a statement. And President Anna Kufa, though, did say, you know, they had a 10 pesos relationship, but all of that is behind them. Uh, just for good measure, his daughter and his wife is actually going to be running as MPs in this forthcoming elections in uh, December. But let's see how their campaigns are going to go. Uh, but like you said, very divided opinion, great loss. Uh, some people reckon in Ghana. And he had a nickname. I don't know for what reasons the Ghanaian called him J.J. Junior Jesus. You know, because he <laughs> saved Ghana. Okay. He turned Ghana around. Okay. Anyway, he opinion. moved Ghana from depression to progress. Opinions are divided on that, but uh, that's all the news headlines. Take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Ruth Zuderi and Michael Wilson at this one. More around here on the Just Give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19 pandemic. Stay with us. It's a pleasure having you back on the morning show. We've got Rotsu Deere with us, uh, giving us Africa Business Update. Over to you, Rotsu. Good morning, uh, Rafai. Good morning, yeah. Tundu. Good morning, morning Doctor. Uh, so Good we morning. kick off with, uh, and it's funny, Doctor asked yesterday, right before we ended our segment, about the Nigerian Stock Exchange and the appreciation we saw yesterday. Later in the day, about 12.55 p.m., uh, the circuit breaker, for the first time in four years since it was introduced, uh, was triggered yesterday on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. The circuit breaker is used in order to control extreme volatility uh, in the market. So if you, and the, the threshold is 5%. So if the market tanks by five percent or it appreciates and spikes by five percent the circuit breaker is put in place and for 30 minutes there will be no trading in order to allow the market catch its breath try to process information that's causing whatever extreme swings that we're seeing so yesterday was the fifth day now that we've seen a massive bull run uh, in the on the Nigerian stock exchange um, I think 12:55 p.m. was when the circuit breaker was put in place and about 1:25 p.m. is when uh, trading resumed so let's look at look at the summary now let's take a look at the summary of the market activity um, yesterday, we saw the market, look at that, 6.23% appreciation yesterday on the market. I think about $45 million worth uh, of trades, is what we saw of trades, is what we saw yesterday in a market that its daily volume is only about maybe two, three, four million dollars. 10,700 deals, 1.9 billion in volume, 17.3 billion in value. Equity cap now, I mean, 
what two days ago i was talking about us touching 18 trillion we're not 18.4 trillion possibly heading towards uh 19 trillion you look at the top five movers the financial sector is still the main sector that's pushing things in terms of the movement there zenith bank fbnh access bank uba fidelity in terms of volume and value they were the ones that were the biggest movers um on the exchange uh yesterday and then look at this chart just just to put it in pictorial form uh, you know from about uh, september 30th i mean you can now see how the market has climbed the market was in negative territory um earlier a few months ago, a few months ago but now we're up about 31 almost approximately 32 percent so far this year and so again doctor just he happened he asked yesterday because t-bill rates are <laughs> the less said about tb rates the better i mean 0.5 percent they're less than one percent investors don't really have where else, much else other options we don't have that many options so they are piling into um the stock markets uh, as 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 it were um so that's really that's kind of the things that's pushing it um as far as fundamentals you still have your fundamental financials and industrial stocks that are that are blue chip stocks and doing well but what you're seeing right now is pretty much funds having to be parked uh, elsewhere because the rates that we're seeing in treasury bills and so on are just not uh, as as attractive but still yesterday was quite a remarkable day in fact yesterday was the biggest gain the stock exchange had seen since april 2015 when uh, president buhari came in uh, into the market and we called it the buhari effect because at that time the market was anticipating reforms and all sorts of things and so there was a lot of euphoria so it was quite quite interesting we'll see how the market trades today at some point, there has to be some kind of profit taking. When you've seen your stocks appreciating in, in value, you want to take your profits off the table. So there might be a pullback. We'll see if that pullback happens today or, or next week. Uh, so moving on from the markets now, we talked about the entrepreneur in uh, Abuja who had grievances with how her office was sealed off and, and so on and so forth. Pebec responded within 24 hours. I mean, it was quite quick. If we take a look at the, uh, the BME, Business Made Easy, this is their profile. So what there is, they're an awareness campaign that communicates Pebex and Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council's reforms um, with respect to what's going on. So they put out a, a set of tweets yesterday addressing the situation. So November 12th, which was yesterday, uh, Jumekel Duole, Special Advisor for President Buhari on ease of doing business, uh, uh, spoke with the MD of, I think, the name of the company is Ellen, uh, Ellen Kitchen and assured her, that's the person we saw in the videos yesterday, of a quick and thorough investigation of the issue. Then, second tweet there, the project manager visited the uh, Guarimpa branch and then proceeded to speak with her. This is key here. The Pebec team, look at the top tweet there. They noted to the officials that it was wrong to have locked up the staff and customers of the restaurant while they were inside. They then said that... Um, Officials explained that, and this is why it's good to listen to both sides. This is the second side. This is their side now. They said the officials explained that the restaurant was sealed following failure to comply with the court summons served on the management of the restaurant. Well, why were they served the court summons? Management was allegedly ch charged to court because relevant regulatory processes relating to food handling in the FCT for the year 2020 had not been completed. At the bottom there, remember she mentioned being asked to pay 250000 They said that that 250000 is a fine for non compliance with the court summons and it wasn't a bribe we move on to the next set of tweets here this is also very very key um, they said Pebex Secretary also noted that the management of Ellen Kitchen would have been better guided if the official FCTA and AMAC um, had published fees and procedures for obtaining the relevant regulatory approvals on their website. And then finally, she assured management that they will continue to work with them. So key things there, you know, they were quick to respond to this. There, there needs to be more transparency and uh, data as far as, look, let me know everything that needs to be paid for every regulatory, you know, uh, requirement. Because remember, she mentioned that in her video. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at the power of social media here with respect to, and I think we probably have a lot to do with this since we covered this uh, extensively yesterday, also on the Global Business Report. But it's good to see that, um, good to see a response. And, um, you know, that, that's pretty much our update for today. I'm really excited that this is brought to the fore, but Pebec too should go one step further as regards making their processes clearer. I mean, I'm sure the woman didn't know about the court summon, you know, if there was a court summon, it should have been that way. And if there was a court summon, I thought a bailiff would have come with them to effect that summon. I mean, correct me, I might be wrong on this. And uh, real quickly, because I know Dr. Man has got some things to say, if the Nigerian stock market was to have a soundtrack, now it would be on fire by Lloyd Banks. I also have something to say. The fact of the matter is that when she went on, the, on Twitter to complain, 
She wasn't met with shock or silence. A lot of people could empathize with her situation. So there is a pervading sense that the Nigeria can be quite a hostile terrain for business, and that needs to be addressed. Even though you're right, this was um, responded to promptly, and it's been handled, which is great, but there's a, a bigger picture that needs to be addressed. Well, I think first we need to commend uh, Jumanka Oduwale and her team for being very responsive. Uh, issues that have been raised here relate to double taxation, and also, uh, secondly, um, you know, uh, whether there's a matter of jurisdiction. I recall that Pebek is saying this has to do with AMAC, which is the Abuja Municipal Council, uh, rather than Pebek itself. But to see the federal government responding, that's very good. Now, very quickly, before uh, we go, uh, the, um, there is a lot of excitement in the stock market. People are buying up stocks because the stocks are, they look like they're cheaper now. You know, people are buying up uh, treasury bills. But you, as uh, a market uh, analyst uh, expert, uh, what would be your advice to investors, uh, despite the uh, circuit breaker that you reported? Yeah, so I wouldn't advise people to buy when you are seeing a wild appreciation like this. The best time to buy stocks is when things were negative, when they were cheaper. So because it's, it's a tendency, as I've said, we, we might see it today. They said that investors like to take profits on the weekend, when they say they can go and spend their money over the weekend. So we might see a pullback today. I could be wrong. But I wouldn't advise anyone to hop into the market now, probably wait for things to cool down a bit. Because this is, I mean, come on. <laughs> what we saw yesterday was quite uh, extraordinary, which is why the circuit breaker was, was put in place. So uh, take, take it easy. Right? Of course, talk to a financial advisor. Please speak to a financial advisor before you make any decisions. But uh, no, don't get in right now. Let, allow things to cool down a bit. And uh, when prices come down a bit is when you can hop in. But we've got some good value stocks on the exchange. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael Wilson, is there a bull run in the stock market on the foreign scene? Or it's just calm? Hello, good morning, Michael. I would. I would completely agree with Rotus. Stay away. It, it, is, it is mad at the moment. There is no sense in what's going on. Uh, as we've said earlier in the week, there were great optimistic about vac optimism about vaccine and so on. And so people went into what's called legacy stocks, the old stocks. Well, they were not very good before, and they're certainly not very good now, but people have gone into them. Now there's a rotation back into tech stocks because suddenly people are beginning to realise that the age-old thing with tech stocks, and it is an age-old thing, is that they actually make a huge amount of money and they're actually quite successful. So not right now. I couldn't agree more with Rotus. If you don't understand it and let the experts get on with it, let the experts lose all the money. You keep your money safe under the mattress. That's my advice right now. So after some signs of um, uh, life at the beginning of the week, it looks like the patient's back in intensive care. Equities lower in Asia this morning after the retreat on Wall Street yesterday. Uh, Nikkei down about 1%. The Cosby down... Um, about a third of a percent. Mainland China continuing that um, China tech hangover. Uh, that, of course, relating to the fact that now, surprise, surprise, the Chinese authorities are going to, t are going to clamp down on companies that are getting too big for what, their boots, like Alibaba, for example, and like, uh, like cancelling the Ant, Ant Financial IPO. Shanghai Composite lower by 1%, Hong Kong down about um, half a percent. The danger is, just to stress what Rotus was saying, is when financial markets price in two years of return to normal growth in the space of two hours, um, it's not unsurprising there aren't any sort of little minnows left to, to keep the momentum going. That certainly was the case after the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, announcement earlier this week. It only took a couple of days. People did go back to legacy stocks, went back to the old ones, and then they suddenly thought, no, wait a minute, we do like tech stocks. Of course we do. Let's get back into them. So that's what they did. Um, a plethora of central bankers yesterday, and this will continue to be the tone, I think, until the end of the year, however that turns out, not that far away, um, have been saying that um, the outlook is pretty cloudy. Well, we could have told them that, couldn't we? And also maybe the vaccine won't be an in instant panacea. Again, we could have told them that. In the U in the US, then it looks fairly serious in New York. Um the mayor of Chicago now has actually offered, uh, has, has said to his citizens an advisory notice to stay at home for, for a period, listen to this, of 30 days. 
30 days at home uh, and asking everybody to cancel their Thanksgiving plans as well. Now, that will bite deep at the American cell because they, they love uh, Thanksgiving, as you well know. And this actually pushed US stocks into weakness yesterday. And here's another thing, of course, the, the, the onset of cold weather in the Northern Hemisphere, where I am now, um, that, that's only going to get worse. And uh, we are going to need a vaccine fairly quickly because as far as we can tell, as far as the, the so-called experts uh, can tell, uh, COVID actually quite likes a cold climate. Um, Donald Trump, he's, he's off, maybe. We think he is now, don't we? Um, but he's keeping up pressure on Beijing, despite leaving, uh, saying that an executive order pro pro prohibiting US investments in Chinese firms owned or controlled by the Chinese military, um, <clears throat> that's... Uh, ramping up pressure on Beijing starting on January the 11th, and they must divest themselves uh, of those kind of securities by November the 11th, i.e. about a year from now, November the 11th, 2021. Um, as far as Europe's concerned, and I include the FTSE in this, um, having rallied for eight days in a row, all slipped back, uh, as you'd expect, for all the optimism about the delivery of a successful vaccine. The reality is that uh, it is still a long, long way away. In France, the number of people required hospitalisation rose yesterday. Here in the UK, the number of people infected by, in a single day rose by nearly 50%. Uh, and unless there is a concern that uh, the case rate slows, any relaxations of uh, what's happening right now could take longer to unfold, increase the longer term potential for economic damage along with that. So, the UK, well, chaos in number 10, the, now the, 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 the Dominic Cummings, the chief advisor to uh, the prime minister, is to leave um, by Christmas. He did say, though, in his defence, this, his, this was a defence he was offering, that he did say when he took the job <clears throat> uh, in January, he would make himself redundant by the end of the year. Um, there is a feeling after the head of communications, Lee Kane, left yesterday, that there is a big change going on. I think there certainly is. It's a question of what that change is. Is it about about softening the government's image. And remember, we have this very, very controversial proposal to increase capital gains tax, the level of income tax. Or are we seeing that he was brought, Cummins was brought in to do a job? And at the time, if you remember, well, you, you, <coughs> we weren't actually talking then, but you, you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. It was brought in to make to make Brexit happen rather than uh, rather than deal with the rest of what was going on in the economy. And suddenly there's a realisation, I think, from our government, at least, that you can't control the whole of the economy from a small cabal of ministers. It has to be a cabinet and has to be slightly uh, wider. Um, yesterday, then, we saw that bounce back in GDP, but September figure was very low. So it's quarter three GDP ending in September. September was very low. Nothing to tell me and a similar kind of conversation commentators, there's anything going well um, about the economy. Oil fall fell overnight on US um, inventory build, and uh, gold continues to consolidate uh, at the bottom of its range. It rose slightly overnight, but it's trapped and this is, I'm no expert on this, but this is what the markets are telling me, between $18.55 and $18.85 a barrel, um, and uh, no, no move that's going to um, help that, I feel. But yesterday we were talking at length, and we, I said I'd talk to you about it this morning. I think there is a certain amount of concern, certainly, although the oil companies won't say this, but certainly the International Energy Authority and also PwC, the international uh, accountants and consultants, were saying yesterday they feel as though the high point in oil was 2019 and the price will fall uh, from now on in. Um, and what tends to happen, of course, is that if entrepreneurs have their way, then green alternatives start to raise themselves up because they they can attract investment to do that. That's the that's the balance right now. All right. Mr. Wilson, How about we can? That's, that's, that's your global view. Yes, Mr. Wilson, you were sceptical when Pfizer came up with the idea that they had come up with uh, a phase three trial of a vaccine that would be about, uh, that's about 90 percent uh, effective. Now, but we see the uh, bosses of the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, and even the U.S. Federal Reserve saying that this has brought a lot of uh, optimism. Now, your position, you took that position about three days ago. Uh, since then, uh, even the uh, Russians have said something more positive, even more positive about Sputnik V. Are you still uh, skeptical about the fact that yeah, this am, vaccine will I, help the global yeah. economy? Of course Republic, I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I am sceptical. I'm sceptical when bank, central bankers say anything. 
I'm skeptical when skeptical when the Russians say anything. I'm skeptical when anybody who say, whose advantage it is to push a vaccine is saying this is going to be a panacea. It quite clearly isn't. There needs to be a lot of testing. There are people who won't take the vaccine, and there there are. There are countries where religiously people will not take the vaccine. And also the vaccine has to be, as far as we can tell, and we don't know the detail, and I'm not an expert on vaccines, but the ones that I've seen have to be kept, for example, at a very low temperature for a very long time. We don't know how many times you're actually going to have to repeat the process. We don't know how long the vaccine is going to last for. There are so many uncertainties about this. No problem with optimism. I think it's a great driver. But, you know, when you're a, an old journo like me, you have to say, do you know what? I don't actually believe this. Let me let me see it actually happen. Let me yeah. see it in delivery yeah. rather than talking about yeah. it. All right, Michael, great for that because even Christian Lagarde, the president of the ECB, did come out yesterday to say, yeah, getting the vaccine is one thing, but she's not exuberant. That was the word she used about the vaccine because the logistic of distribution is going to be a big problem. But I just want to ask you very critically on this. Increasing capital gains tax at a point in time like this for the British economy isn't it going to overheat the economy amidst all of this fighting like rats in the sack that is going on in the Conservative Party? And just for good measure, I think uh, Boris Johnson should have fired Dominic Cummings after the coronavirus scandal that broke. He shouldn't have waited till this time. He should have fired him long well, ago. If, if I see him over the weekend, I'll, I'll offer that advice to him and see what he says. I suspect, yeah. I suspect his reply will be, will be fa fairly unprincipled. About capital gains tax, here it is. It's getting a lot of complaints now from entrepreneurs who are saying that if capital gains tax, that's how a lot of them make their money, actually increases up to the level of income tax, it'll stifle entrepreneurism. I would expect them to say that because that's their gig. However, if, for example, supposing there were a firm of entrepreneurs that had come up with a green alternative to help energy away from oil and they but they had to move away from one's country to another one which had a lower capital gains tax would that be a, a a triumph for the people who impose the tax no it would not we do need to do this i, I think this has just been floated i it's not in legislation yet it's just and, and there are so many people now saying this is such a bad idea i think it'll overheat i think what it might do is drive people away that that's my worry and you never want to drive entrepreneurs away well, I mean, uh, Lee Ken, Director of Communications, uh, is leaving. Uh, Cummings is leaving. How dysfunctional is uh, number 10 Downing Street? Uh, because all well, the papers are yeah. saying, oh, Downing Street is dysfunctional and all of that. I is it a no, case I, I think... of the Prime Minister losing control? Uh, Carrie Simmons, as I asked you yesterday, uh, being the uh, power behind it. <laughs> When you, when, you, when you asked me about Carrie Simmons, I remember walking away from my computer here thinking... I can remember, it was like Yoko Ono and the Beatles, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Yoko. When, when she said, oh, I don't like that song, and they're saying, I'm sorry, what are you going to do with you? Oh, I'm, I'm going out with John Lennon. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, of course you are. You know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, no, I, 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 don't think, I don't think he's losing control. I think what he's doing is, if, if anything, and, again, I'm not a political expert, but looking at it, I think what he's doing is he's kind of softening the image. Cummins did his job, whatever you like it or not, he did his job. That he was hard. He pushed people into shape, and it was a it was a very flabby cabinet. I, I am not necessarily saying it's a good one right now, but I feel as though what we're going back to is some kind of cabinet administration of the UK economy because it is small, but it is very complicated, and you can't really run it, you know, from by from just a few people. I feel as though that's what's going on. So both those people have done their job. Uh, Lee Kane uh, was a journalist really a long time ago with one of our um, newspapers. I mean, the level of communication from government over COVID has been disgraceful. So that right. could account for his going. Dominic Cummings, I think he did his job. He said, if you go back to what he said right at the beginning of the year when he was given the job, he said, I'm go I will be out of the job by December, which, which is true. That's his defence. Now, you read of that what you will. But if I see Boris over the weekend, I'll, I'll give him that advice. All right, uh, real quickly, Michael, I just want to any updates on Brexit. Uh, Michelle Barnier been around in and out of town lately. Any updates in like about a minute, if you can do that. Well, first. Only, only that I was listening to um, a couple of politicians on the radio early this morning, German ones, who were saying that, um, you know, it's, it's a terrible kind of thing and all the rest of it. And quite rightly, and I would have said this too, you know, from our side of things, you're saying, but hang on, it takes two to tango, you know, and, and a deal does need to be done. Already figures have come out of Germany and France saying how much they will lose if there is no Brexit 
Brexit deal. It has to be done. Of course, it's going to founder on things. Or it's going to, going to, it's going to, there's going to be discussion about things like state aid and competition and fisheries as well. These are big subjects. They, they do need to be hammered out. And I, but I suspect that you have to actually t- drag feet to the fire and say, we really need to do this right now. Some kind of deal, I think, will happen by the end of the year. It won't be what everybody wants. But then again, very few deals are, are they? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. We we'll look forward to seeing you. Oh, no, it's Friday. Oh, it's Friday. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs> <laughs>
across the globe when they do arrive. And finally, one of the first cruise ships to ply through the Caribbean waters since the pandemic began has ended its trip abruptly after the captain announced that five members on board had tested positive for coronavirus. Now, the report suggests that a passenger became sick on Wednesday and forced the ship to turn back to Barbados, where it had departed on Saturday. However, the ship had yet to dock in Barbados when local authorities insisted they must test those on board. And of course, the Sea Dream uh, was carrying 53 passengers and 66 crew, uh, with the majority of the passengers coming from the US. So uh, no surprises there, really. Well, um, Adesua, first, let's commend the uh, European countries the European countries and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation contributing money to ensure that poor countries have access yes. uh, to uh, COVID vaccine when uh, eventually it's right there on the table. Because the whole idea of the ACT accelerator that you refer to, or the COVAX Alliance, yeah. led by WHO and um, Gavi, led by Gavi, is about ensuring COVID equality, or if you like, vaccine equity. And, you know, about 186 countries had signed up uh, to that COVAX alliance. But the problem has also been one of funding. Mm -hmm. uh, WHO and, uh, and um, Gavi, they've been looking for support. And, you know, some countries have not been forthcoming. And I think that in, in this regard, we should raise questions about the role of the United States, mm -hmm. China, and I think Russia. Yes, Russia. Three big, rich countries uh, that are refusing to put funds uh, into it. And it all takes us back to the uh, point made by Ursula von uh, uh, Leyen, I think that's the name. She says, look, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Exactly. So the whole point about rich countries supporting poor countries is about the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of our humanity. And I think before now, WHO uh, DG, uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, also made the point about global solidarity. Mm -hmm. He said it is better for some people in all countries to be vaccinated to have uh, access to the vaccine down from all people in some countries uh, to be uh, 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 vaccinated so the whole issue is about global solidarity as the world tries to find a solution uh, to covid 19 not vaccine nationalism which is also a point that the who uh, dg has been commenting upon but what is nigeria doing i know we have signed up uh, to the uh, covas uh, alliance is anybody in Nigeria, from the office of the vice president to the uh, uh, NCDC, thinking about the plan for Nigeria? Because at the end of the day, we can see all of these politics. Uh, okay, we will help poor countries. We will look. The rich countries will still get it first. Indeed, we need to look beyond, you know, um, Covax as middle and low income countries to actually go and pre-order and purchase our own vaccines. We should not be relying on COVAX. It may just I mean, not when, be When enough. are we even going to start making our own vaccines? We keep talking about the, the long stories of how we used to produce yellow fever vaccine here. When are we going to start taking those vaccines in and making them here <laughs> if we have the rights to make them? I mean, that's a question we should be asking ourselves in the long run, because it's not easy to talk about COVAX. Those ones will settle themselves first. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this contention about America giving Pfizer. Pfizer is coming out to say America didn't give us money. But in some cases, some countries pre broke mm -hmm. Britain has already brought out the timetable of how they're going to give these vaccines to people. Mm -hmm. When are we going to sort our own issues out? And another point that you made, thank you for that reminder, the um, wrong presidential task force yes. advised Nigerians against non-essential travel. And thank you for that story about the Caribbean cruise. Why on earth is anybody going on a Caribbean cruise It's pandemic now? fatigue. Uh, oh, to Lord. Do pandemic fatigue. Everybody's tired. They were asking out. for it, though, I did yes. swear. I mean, there are consequences for those actions. <laughs> yes. Quite painful, but uh, the world will never be Thank you very much, uh, Adesua Amora. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> uh,